All right, so I'd like to bring out a gentleman who needs no introduction. Oh, okay. Oh, it, it's Dave Foley. <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? I need to drop my shit off here. There we go. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <sighs> so, you uh, might know Dave from, I don't know, Kids in the Hall? You, you've, you've heard of that? Let's, let's hope so. There we go. News Radio, News the Radio, Guy, right. Bugs Life. Bugs Life, uh, Dan Vert's Postal. <laughs> yeah, probably nobody. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I get, well, yeah, 30, 30 uh, almost 40 years of almost succeeding. Uh, but you're here at Terrific Time. You have succeeded. I have. I've so. been very fortunate. And it looks like we already have a question, so we, we will go ahead. Where, who are you? Where are you from? Hi, my name's Kevin. I'm from Wallingford, Connecticut. Social Security? Um, no, yeah. no, no, we don't need that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, my question, like, I know you as Flick from A Bug's Life. I grew up with that movie. I loved it so much. And yep. I was just wondering, how did you get involved in uh, A Bug's Life? Was that, like, right after Toy Story got big? Did you, like, had you heard of Pixar before then, or did they make it, like... I was, I was a huge... Uh, well, I was always a huge fan of animation. So, uh, lifelong. And then... Uh, and uh, so when I, I saw uh, Toy Story, the first one, I was blown away by it. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a whole new art form that's just been created. Uh, and these, these guys are the ones who have taken it over the top. And I really wanted to meet them. So I, I was going to audition for it uh, uh, with... Uh, I actually went, went over, uh, really, really just went to the audition because I just wanted to meet John Lasseter and Andrew Stanton. And... Uh, and went there with uh, Vicki Lewis and Steve Root from News Radio. We went on our lunch break over to, we were all going to audition. And uh, so we were there to audition and uh, Vicki and Steven did their auditions. And just before I was gonna go in to do mine, uh, they came up and said, Dave, I'm so sorry, but Carol Burnett just came in. Do you mind if we bump you for Carol? And I said, you have to bump me for Carol. You should always bump everyone for Carol. And so, but then I had to go back to work. So I didn't audition that day. And uh, I think uh, John and Andrea felt uh, guilty about bumping me. So they let me come back. And this time they let me come back to read for Flick, which I wasn't gonna read for originally. And uh, so I think they did it just to be nice. And, uh, and then, and. Basically, I was in the middle of the audition, and Andrew and John just started turning to each other and going, oh, you see what he's doing there? Well, yeah, we could do that, and we could take that, we could adapt this other scene this way. And I said, and I went, guys, you haven't hired me, you know. <laughs> and they went, oh, right, well, yes, our people will be in touch with you. <laughs> and so that was how I got, I got a bug's life. It was, uh, I, I got to be Flick because Carol Burnett bumped me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just to, just to follow up, because you mentioned, who was the character that you were reading for originally? I was originally reading for the part of Slim, the stick insect. Oh. So that was the part I was, I was uh, playing. Uh, which they gave it to David Hyde Pierce. He's not bad. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know it's very loud. I can't. I know it's very sensitive, and, which is uh, odd, because I'm very insensitive. Um, <laughs> Oh, Please. Hi. Your name and where are you from? Hi, Jim from uh, Massachusetts. News radio. So um, when Phil Hartman passed away, was there a thought, you know, obviously John Lovitz came in, but of not continuing? Or what was, what was the mindset when that tragedy happened? There was actually for there was quite a while when we were all talking about it and thinking about whether or not we would come back and do another season, and uh, we'd all I know we'd all we'd all gathered as a group with our our crew and our writers and the whole cast had gathered at Paul Sims house and we were all talking, and it was our our uh, and it was really it was our, I think our director Tom Sharon is kind of really kind of uh, swayed everyone and he he just sort of said look we've lost. He, you know, basically made a speech to us all and said, "Look, we've lost, we've lost Phil. Let's not lose each other right now." And that was kind of the. Uh, oh, it's making me cry to think about it. Um, but that was basically the the decision at the time was that we just we were all in shock and mourning, and uh, and Tom just sort of said, "Look, we let's, you know, let's be together through this." And so we decided, and we reached out to John Lovitz to see if he would uh, to uh, you know. Uh, come in and, and help us out, and he agreed to. But yeah, it was a really hard decision, and I think it was. Uh, 
Uh, I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did do the fifth season because I, I think I would have been heartbroken to not see everybody again. You could tell the emotion when you guys came back after Phil Hartman. That was yeah. That first that first episode was was. Uh, I think we were all kind of in denial through the week of rehearsal, and then we got on the floor. And once we were doing it in front of the audience, it, I think it kind of hit every. And you see it on camera. You see exactly. I think we only did one take of that scene. Right. And. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, you were just sort of seeing a bunch of people uh, mourning, and uh, with mourning, but with, in, with with a really good script to do it with. The, the quick follow-up is: Was John Lovitz picked because of the Saturday Night Live connection he had with Phil Hartman? Well, he was one of Phil's best friends, uh, and he had already he had actually already been in two episodes of uh, News Radio in the past as two different characters. So we thought, what the hell? Give him, they have him play a third character. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, it was mostly just that he was really one of Phil's oldest and best friends. Did Phil used to do all his, all his impressions, his voices, like off camera for you guys? He you did for us and, and for the, the uh, studio audience. He would usually go up uh, every, every uh, show night. He would go up and talk to the audience. He'd do like about 20 minutes of material for the audience, uh, which was always fun. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Hi, I'm uh, Jeremy from Norwich. Hey, Jeremy. Um, hi. Um, I was wondering about... How are your, things in Norwich? They're, they're not good. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they're all right. But um, I was wondering about uh, your character, who's like the friend of Kevin McDonald's uh, pathological liar. The... You, oh, you the, oh, like oh, the, uh, oh the, the King of Empty Promises sketch. Yeah, that, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Dean Dean and Lex Hare, I believe, are our names. I couldn't even remember, but yeah. Um, that friend character, he's like, I don't know, he seems like in a perpetual state of, like, barely contained panic. Yes. And I was just wondering if there's, like, someone that's based on or some origin to that. Uh, it's based on, uh, on, the, on the person that's actually inside my head uh, <laughs> that I don't allow out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and yeah, and also based on you know how frustrated I I, uh, I, I often was with Kevin, who is the king of empty promises. <laughs> you did it really well. So um, I have one uh, follow-up question. That's uh, do you remember in um, 2008 in Clearwater, Florida, at Ruth Eckerd Hall, uh, you did a Kids in the Hall show, and at the end you guys came out to bow. And there was a girl in like the third row that like popped up and said, "I love you, Dave Foley," and you pointed at her and waved. Yes, I do. Okay, good. <laughs> was that girl you? <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, it's good to see you again. That, that was my little sister. I was there with her, and uh, she she really she's a huge fan, and uh, she's actually such a big fan of you that she has seen High Stakes. Oh my God! Oh, yeah. there's no, that's not there's no call for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I told her I would ask you that, or she asked me to ask you that, so thank you. All right, well, give, give her my love. I will. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Assuming she still loves me. <laughs> yes, she Otherwise, screw does. her. She does. Yeah. <laughs> there, for, for 12 years, there was a cat named after you. Oh, oh really? Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, they're, they're looking for people who are wearing clothes. You know, we could... Hmm? Get <laughs> oh, everyone going cognito. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of which, you know, yeah. you you returned. There's new episodes of the kids in the hall. Has everyone been watching the new episodes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm willing to apologize to some of you for the first sketch in the first episode. <laughs> to others, I'm willing to say you're welcome. <laughs> um, so how is it the same, and how is it different coming back? Uh, it's, well, it's it's. It's it's very much the same in that and that we're still the same assholes that we were 40 years ago, um, and uh, and uh, it was uh, I, I guess that was the thing coming back to it. I guess our we had the same worry that I think a lot of the uh, fans of the show had, which would be uh, is this going to just ruin it? Is this going to just despoil all the memories? And uh, and do we still have anything new to say? And uh, and I think once we got in the writers' room, it felt very much like old times, where we were, you know, making, you know, just making each other laugh and throwing out ideas to each other, and and sort of being excited by each other's ideas and going, oh, that's that's a good sketch, and really being as as surprised as anybody that we could still write good sketches. <laughs> uh, so it was a, it was a, it was it was very nice. It was different in that we uh, some of us move a lot slower. Uh, I'm talking about Kevin McDonald. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, just yeah, we're just we're all older and a little uh, a little less uh, a little less punk rock anger to us than we used to have. <laughs> but uh, and you decided to decided to start it off with a, a nude sketch, which you know was a choice. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. It was definitely an awesome sketch. Again, there's a microphone over here, so I, I know you've got questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. Unless you have a theatrical voice and you can just shout it from wherever you are. Uh, we're recording, so yeah. my Oh, well good. then, no. <laughs> then don't, don't. Hi, Justin from Enfield. Hello, and, Justin from uh, Enfield. Oh, nice to meet you. I was you said these are very medieval in names we all have. I am Justin of Enfield. I am Dave of Etobicoke. <laughs> well met, good sir. <laughs> my question for you is, who were your comedic influences? My community, well, there's a lot of them, uh, going back to... The and would Mar SCTV be, were you influenced SCTV by SCTV would be huge amongst them, yeah. And uh, I, I used to, yeah, I used to, my, my job, we used to live in a small town, and we had just a, sh a really crappy antenna on the floor of our attic, and we could barely get the channel that SCTV was on in our town. So my job every week when it was about, uh, it was about an hour before the show would come on is I had to go up into the, uh, the attic and start adjusting the antenna while my, and shouting out the window to my, par my parents who were in the living room uh, two stories down and going, can you see anything yet? So I had to do that. So uh, that's how much we loved uh, SCTV in its original state. And, uh, and I've happily gotten to be friends with most of them. In fact, I, was, I just had a long uh, phone conversation with Dave Thomas from SCTV just the other day. Uh, we usually get together in, at Arts Deli in, in uh, the Valley every a few times a year for lunch. But I got to be friends with all, except for John Candy, sadly. I never got to meet John. Uh, but yeah, they were, they, I mean, they were the best. You know, they were, they were just the best. Do you have a sketch that stands out as one of your favorites? Uh, a Second City sketch that stands out? Um, oh, God, there's so many. It's, I, used to, I, I, I loved their soap opera parody that they started doing on the NBC show. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. Some sort of days. The, these are the days, days of, of the week. week. That was it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also loved, uh, uh, was, I loved, uh, God, that's just so many, so many of them. I loved, it's more the ace, it's more the characters. I love like Bob, all the Bobby Bittman stuff, the Lola, uh, uh, Lola Falana character, Catherine's character. I mean, there's just so much great stuff, you know. Thank you very much. Thank appreciate you. it. Well, I guess that's it. Oh, no, there you are. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Michael from New Haven. Hi, Michael from New Haven. Um, so I'm willing to admit on this microphone that I did buy a ticket to see Postal in theaters. <laughs> oh my God! Oh my! Wow! You be, that's. Uh, I, I, I know. It pretty, I know. I huh? was, I was I young. Um, so my question is, what was the creative process like working with one of the worst directors who has ever lived? Um, yeah, I don't think he deserves that title. He's actually a pretty good director. He's made some pretty terrible movies, uh, but he's. He's actually technically pretty good, except that I don't think Uva really uh, regards the movies themselves as the art form. I think for him the art form is pissing off critics. Uh, so he makes the movies just so he has something to argue with people about. Um, and that definitely was a movie that was one of those things where, he, where I know I signed on to it uh, having read one script and showed up to an entirely new script. <laughs> which I guess is not unusual with Uva. And I remember going to him, uh, I remember saying to him, said, Uva, this, I gotta say, uh, this scene, this kills it. You're not, this is not gonna, no one's gonna see this. But he just didn't care. So he was a very, very interesting guy. I actually really like him. Uh, uh, and he was a, and a very interesting guy to talk to, a very much a provocateur. And I think for him, as I said, I think for him, the art, the art form is the controversy and not the movies themselves. Thanks. All right. So, Dave, I'm a big Stargate fan, and you got to be on Stargate Atlantis as McKay's nemesis. Yes. What was your experience like on that? Uh, oh, that was really fun. Uh, first of all, just the, the, the cast on that are great. And then on top of that, we had uh, the other guest stars were uh, Bill Nye and... Uh, <laughs> and um, no. Uh, uh, astrophysicist. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you. Thank you, Brain, for kicking in. <laughs> so I got to hang out with you know, Bill, Bill Nye and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I knew Bill Nye before, too, because uh, I knew Bill Nye when he was uh, in a sketch comedy group in Seattle. 
they used to do a show called Thursday Night Live out of Seattle. Ooh. And so I remember meeting, uh, meeting him up there when we were touring with the kids in the hall. So, uh, so it was great to hang out with those guys. It was great to be, uh, to be able to you know, shout a bunch of sci-fi jargon and because uh, as a big sci-fi fan it was a real real kick for me and you almost destroyed the world so i did which that. is nice yeah yeah, yeah. Who, who hasn't you know and, at some yeah. point and i got to pretend to be a genius <laughs> which for a stupid guy is a lot of fun i'm not going to comment on that <laughs> <laughs> again microphone over here um though i do have to add this is a little more deep if there's one piece of advice that someone a friend a mentor a co-worker gave you that kind of like clicked for you that just kind of like changed your thoughts on, on hmm. anything whether it's your career <laughs> or life well Lord, what would that be Lauren Michaels once told us never take a goofy photo because that's the one they'll show as your in your uh, obituary okay so that's good advice yeah, yeah so yeah. never do so we always told us never take a goofy photo and how many so goof, tried goofy photos that. have you taken I've yourself? tried to never take any on <laughs> Lauren's advice yeah I think it was uh, we've tried to yeah we've made a lot of uh We've made probably thousands of photographers very unhappy over the years. By, you know, and we've heard this more than once from photographers. I thought you guys are supposed to be funny. <laughs> like, yeah, but not for photos. <laughs> yeah. Watch the video. Sir. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? Good. So I really enjoyed the work. Wait, wait. Who are you? Where are you from? This is, this is, oh, sorry. You know. Yeah. Protocol. We have to geotag you because they're going to follow you home. <laughs> Eh, Depends on the they question. used to put phone books on everyone's doorstep so everyone can find me if they really needed to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm Mike. I'm from New York, New York City. New York City, heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Some people have. Yeah. It's pretty good. I liked, its, I liked its original name, but whatever. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and my question is about a show you did that took place in New York City. Um, okay. I love the brief stint that you did on Will and Grace when you played what was Jack's longest relationship on the original show. Yes, yes. What can you recall? I mean, I could just imagine that must have been such a fun show to work on. It was really fun. It was, uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, on Will and Grace. I played Jack's only boyfriend in the entire run of the show, I think. In the original run? In the original run of the show. A fiance in this reboot. It's in the, the reboot, original. yes, which I was very mad about. Uh, I, I wanted you back in season seven. <laughs> I didn't like that you've... Yeah, no, I was fun, and I and I, I stayed friends with Sean and Eric, uh, and um, there it was it was great. It was also very intimidating because uh, there's this uh, old English dude uh, named John Cleese was yeah. on the show, <laughs> and for uh, for a sketch comedian, uh, that's uh, that's sort of like. Go, oh, here would the you, Holy Grail. Yeah, yeah. Would you like? <laughs> would you like to say hello to God? Um, and he's about the same height as God too, uh, so it was very intimidating. But uh, so, so that was uh, that was uh, exciting. I actually remember uh, going up to John Cleese and saying, "Sir, I just want to say I'm I'm a sketch comedian as well, and it's an honor to get to meet you." And he turned to the first AD and said, "Who is this? Do I have to be nice to him?" <laughs> <laughs> So it was a delightful, delightful getting to meet him. Thank you. Uh, oh, there's Mike. Uh, I'm Isabel from West Haven, and uh, I was wondering if you had someone you looked up to when you were younger that was like, "Oh, well, I want to do this," that influenced you. What to that you wanted to do, or did you wake up one day and be like, hmm, I want to be a sketch comedian? Uh, well, you know what? Originally, I wanted to be a stand-up comic. Uh, when I was 17, I started doing uh, stand-up. And uh, in those days, I mean, I was, obviously, I was very much influenced by people like George Carlin and Richard Pryor, and, uh, and also uh, one of my heroes, a guy named Bob Newhart. Um, and I also, you know, and also got really, I really got, when I was 17, I got really into studying Lenny Bruce when I was a kid. So I, I, so there was a little while there where I was trying my best to be a 17-year-old Lenny Bruce, which is not a good idea. Uh, you can't really be a social satirist at 17, uh, and not not without people just going, "Oh gosh, that's adorable." <laughs> um, but yeah, but definitely, uh, uh, I really like studied like Bob Newhart's albums, and uh, and and uh, he was one of my heroes, and I I think I've done a fairly good job of ripping him off for the past uh, 35 years and because uh, like like Bob I have a, a bit of a stammer and uh, so I was able to I learned how to use the stammer and the pause as a way to remember my next line <laughs> awesome thank you thank you hello hello I am I 
am Greg from Massachusetts. I'm not believing you, Greg. You were a little hesitant. I think you're, I think you're lying to me. I'm not lying. All right, whatever. So, Whoever you are. <laughs> so if, if I'm remembering correctly, you were the yes guy in the fall of New Vegas. Oh, so my, yeah. So yeah. my question is, what was it like when you got that role? Uh, of Yes Man? Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because I'd never done a, 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 do we call it a video game or a computer game? Uh, video game. Video game. All right. Because I'd never done one of those before. So it was, it was uh, and they, they just called up and offered it. And uh, so, and I guess, and especially in those days, I think it's changed a lot now. Oh, the, yeah. The, the recording of, for, a, for a, uh, a video game is a little more fluid. But in those days, you had, you had to record all the dialogue, then kind of record like just individual words with different inflections. And, and it was a really interesting thing. And I'm, uh, and I'm not good enough at video games to have ever played the game. So, but I keep hearing it's good. Uh, every time I used to try to play, my kids would just grab the controllers out of my hands and <laughs> just and sh just shame faced <laughs> at how terrible I was. But I'm, I'm yeah, but I'm glad I keep hearing that people uh, like that character. Yeah, I love that. I really love that character. Well, thank you, whoever you are, <laughs> and wherever you're from. Okay, Greg, <laughs> thank you for your question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick. Flew in from Minneapolis. Did you? Wow. When I get a chance to meet you and stuff like that. I'm a big fan of the original Tick. Uh, oh, the Tick series, yeah. Yes, yes. Loved it. Yeah. The, the recent one, man. I loved, I loved the other one. What was it like working with Patrick Warburton? Well, I, I, Patrick's amazing. Uh, I, know if, uh, I guess I'm assuming a lot of you know Patrick from, from The Tick, and also, he was also, of course, on Seinfeld mm -hmm. for quite a bit. And he also did five episodes of News Radio with us. Uh, so I knew Patrick from that, but that was, he's amazing. I think he's, I mean, I always tell him that I thought Patrick was the, the heir apparent to uh, Adam West uh, as, as one of the funniest, uh, you know, big, big sort of handsome guys in the business. And so it was, it was amazing getting to work with, with him on that show. I also like It's Pat. I you like it? Me too. I that was a very funny movie. I think it was, uh, yeah, it's Pat, and now it's sort of almost ahead of its time as a gender fluid movie love story. Um, that was, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Pat was a character that Julia Sweeney used to do on Saturday Night Live. Uh, and part of the character was that nobody could uh, d determine the, uh, the gender of Pat, uh, and people were very confused by it. And inside story is that. That wasn't ever originally a part of that character. When Julia started doing the character, it was based on a friend of hers. So she would do this character who was just like kind of really weird and too, who would stand too close and was too needy and didn't pay attention to any social cues. And, uh, and she would play the character and, at uh, Groundlings and people would, uh, everyone would keep going, is that a man or a woman? I don't, what the hell is that? <laughs> and so when she did it on Saturday Live, they had to incorporate that into the character and that kind of became the hook. Well, I know you played the character Chris. I did. And I know on SNL, they, they always, she always referred to Chris, or mm -hmm. Pat always referred to Chris, I should say. Um, did you ever, first of all, audition for Saturday Night Live? And did you ever appear on that show as Possibly Chris. I never did. I did audition with the kids in the hall in uh, 1985. Uh, we all auditioned for Saturday Night Live, and two of us got hired as apprentice writers. But uh, and that led to us eventually getting our own TV show. But uh, no, I've never been on Saturday Night Live. Um, and uh, no, I have, no. It really, now that I think about it, uh, I don't understand why. Uh, Let's start a write-in campaign now, to now, get him on Saturday Night yeah, Live. Now I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a little mad at Lauren now. Let's, yeah. yeah. All right, well, be, thank you. I'm going to make an angry phone call later. Thank you. Do it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm Chris from Massachusetts. Well, hello, Chris from Massachusetts. Um, you know, growing up, I was a fan of A Bug's Life, but I was also a fan of a little movie called Sky High. Oh, yes. And I was wondering what your experience was with that movie and how you got involved with it. Uh, uh, that was, uh, again, it was just one of the things where I, I got, uh, it was uh, an offer came in from Mike, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name of the director, who was a really great director. Mike Mitchell, yes. Uh, and uh, so he, 
he uh, made an offer, I guess, and he offered a, another part to Kevin McDonald from the Kids in the Hall because he was a he was a Kids in the Hall fan, and uh, and it was it was great. I mean, I think uh, I uh, I mean I thought the script was hilarious. I thought the premise was great. Uh, Kurt Russell, I think, is fantastic at comedy, so it was really fun to get to play his his uh, sidekick, and. Um, and I think that it was. Uh, I I think we all loved making that movie. I mean, there were so many great great people in that cast. It still holds up. Yeah, and I think I think we might have had a franchise on our hands if Disney hadn't put out uh, The Incredibles the same week. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so we, which is really because the, they were both Disney pictures. Um, but yeah, The Incredibles kind of uh, knocked uh, uh, Sky High off the map when it when it came out, which was which was too bad. But. Uh, you know, at least this, it's one movie that my kids like, so. <laughs> They're not embarrassed by you? They're not embarrassed yeah. by that one, no. All, okay. all of my kids seem to like that one. Which ones are they embarrassed All by? the other ones, all of oh, them. Oh, all of them, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Tony from New York. My name is Dave. Nice to meet you, Dave. From Toronto. Pleasure. Uh, Mike? I currently live in New York, though. Excellent. I did live in Los Angeles for quite some time. <laughs> that was my question. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, two quick questions. The first one of which is, do you know anyone who could get me Canadian, uh, uh, so, so I could be a Canadian citizen on the D? Oh, citizenship. I was wondering what you're looking for. Yeah. I thought you were, this, yeah. this country. I thought you were for, it, for right? Canadian hookers, or. <laughs> I mean, that too. Yeah, I was gonna... That too. <laughs> Uh, so we'll, we'll talk later about that. Canadian citizenship. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm. I, you know, I'm I, I, I got to figure that out for my daughter, uh, for her, for her safety. Uh, yeah, cause my, I have an American daughter, so I, yeah, I got to figure out how to get her Canadian citizenship sometime soon, and right, me American citizenship it. too. I got to. Do, do you know where I can get that? Uh, we'll, we'll talk later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One other question, uh, real quick, is: uh, Did you ever write? a skit or bit so depraved and sick that you just decided it could not be staged and written and um, forward with? Hmm. Hmm. It's hard. I'm trying to think if there's one that was too much for us. Uh, I think there might have been one, but for legal reasons, I can't tell you about it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Gerald <clears throat> I'm Jer from Bridgeport. Well, hello. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, first, I want to say uh, I enjoyed you on Scrubs, one of my favorite shows. Oh, thanks. That, yeah, that was a fun show. You did like the, three or four episodes. I don't remember, but you was great. You know? Yeah. And the best thing was the hospital they shot in was I could go through my backyard, hop over the fence, and I was in their, in their studio. So it was the best commute I've ever had in show business. Is that how you got the part? You just hopped your fence, and they're yeah, like, oh, said, hey, 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 guys, do you need anything? <laughs> Sure. Got any on. spare acting? <laughs> I also had to rake the yard, but. Uh. I wanted to ask, um, as an actor, uh, M at one time, NBC had you no know, news radio, Seinfeld, Frasier, Friends. With the birth of all the um, streaming services, do you think sitcoms on networks are over, or they could make a comeback on networks? It's hard to say because uh, the, like the, uh, the multi camera sitcom has died a thousand deaths. I think, going, going back to the 50s, I think they keep dying. And everyone kept saying, oh, that's the end of the sitcom. Uh, and definitely, it definitely seems like the 90s was the last big time for multicam sitcoms. Um, but I, I think there's a chance they could come back. I think maybe they could, uh, maybe they could make a, I mean, I guess they, Netflix tried with uh, that Ashton Kutcher show. That was multicam on Netflix. It wasn't, and it was a One Day at a Time reboot. That was on Netflix too, wasn't it? But, uh, I mean, I think it's a great art form. I think people, people I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think multicam in front of a live audience is a great art form. And one that gets kind of disparaged because uh, there have been so many, I, again, <laughs> again, because there, there have been so many terrible ones. But when it's done well, I mean, people sort of think single camera is more artistic than multicam. But my example is really so. Would you say that Gilligan's Island, which was a single camera show, is more artistic than uh, All in the Family? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You. Yeah, <laughs> like it shows like Mary, like Mary Tyler Moore show is probably one of the most important cultural creations of the last century. So, and, and that's a multicam sitcom in front of a live audience. And so I, ho I hope they make a comeback because uh, I'm really good at it. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Hello. My name's Christopher. Hello, Christopher. I'm from way, way upstate New York, and for the longest time, my wife would make fun of me for being Canadian until <laughs> she realized I don't take it as an insult. <laughs> so, That's good, because we all do. Yeah. Um. But because I was so far upstate New York, we got several Canadian channels and thus, you know, kids in the hall. Yeah, where were you? Uh, it's a, called Copenhagen in the township at Dunark. Okay, now you're just telling lies. Yeah, what do you... No, seriously. I, and, and whenever I see... Uh, yeah, yeah. Go places... Yeah, you know what? I'm from Brigadoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There'll be a Disneyland. There'll be someone from the real Copenhagen, Denmark. I go, I'm also from Copenhagen, Denmark. And they'll look at me and like, they don't, they don't sound <laughs> But in any case, I'm a big fan of Girl Drink Drunk. Oh, well, thank you. And... Yeah. yeah. And no, I'm the rest of you should applaud, too, even yeah, if you haven't seen it. If you don't know it, look it up. It's worth it. Yeah. And I just want to know, do you actually know how to make a squash strawberry alley cat? I, I don't, <laughs> because oh, we, we, there's a time lapse in that yeah, sketch right, once exactly. we start. But I do know this for a fact that uh, I started getting mail from all over uh, North America from bars after that that started inventing drinks based Excellent. on the drinks in that sketch. Excellent. So there were, there, were, uh, there were bars all over the place that were serving squash strawberry alley cats and bourbon bubbles and uh, I forget what else. <laughs> and the French guys going out to getting suits. Oh, they, oh we got, you know. Uh, yeah, go many, many Armani. Yeah, yes. Armani, yeah. Yes. we go hunt some more. Yeah. So well, thank, thank you very much. Thank in, you. In upstate New York, there was very little. Okay, that well, let's forget with your lies. That was a bright spot. Just, yeah. Why you, I guess you're probably in the witness uh, protection program. That's why you won't <laughs> yeah. give your real address. Everyone there was. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, cheers. Nice to meet you. You'd probably get royalties off the drinks that these bars are making. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. That'd be, I that'd wish be I was, good. I should be more litigious. I should, yeah. Well, you want to be American, you're, you're going to be more litigious. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, my name is Josh from Groton. Hi, how uh, are you? Doing all right, and how are you doing? Today? I'm good today. I'm having a lovely day. Uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you for coming to Connecticut to do this for all of us because 2022 has been like a real great oh, year. Oh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is in your entire career, if you had a chance to change anything, what would it be? My shoulders? <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that wouldn't have been as good in drag if I had actual male shoulders. So I guess that's probably, it probably works out for the best. Uh, change anything? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, maybe, uh, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, I guess I wish I'd made better friends with Judd Apatow. <laughs> I mean, I had a chance, I really blew it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris from Wallingford. Well, hello, Chris. Now, I won't lie to you. I had no idea who you are until I got here today, but my friend was super excited about you. <laughs> but over the course of sitting in this panel, I've learned that you're in a lot of things I really enjoy. So well, there I was sitting on an IMDb. Maybe you should have paid better attention. You know, I know. <laughs> it's my fault. You know, uh, uh, maybe don't, maybe, maybe uh, stop, put down the newspaper when you're watching a movie. <laughs> That's whole problem. So, All right. But there I was on IMDb looking for your true, uh, looking through your filmography, and I saw that you did an episode of Drunk History, and I'm just so curious. Do they actually like hand you a script for that with all the ramblings, or do you just get shoved in a costume, thrown on a set, and there's a recording of a dude just completely drunk that you're trying to follow along with? They have a, they have a script of it. Okay. And they play back, and of course they also play back the recording of the drunk, uh, drunk celebrities uh, telling telling the historical stories, uh, and it's way more difficult than I would have thought. I, I, <laughs> it just it looks like it would be something difficult, and I sit there and I just wonder. I'm like, that's got to be just so hard to sit there like here and be like, what am I doing now again? Okay. I know, and you, the really stupid thing is that uh, I had quit I quit drinking because I would have much rather been the drunk guy than the guy <laughs> doing the talking. <laughs> 
so but by the time I fa- by the time I got around to being on the show I was uh, I was sadly sober um, <laughs> but yeah you it was uh, yeah it was a lot of work to try to make sure you match the lips as close enough to mm-hmm. get the illusion and still give, give some sort of a performance <laughs> all right thank you thank you and it's, it's a great show too I gotta say hello hello My name is Michael from Bristol Connecticut all right uh, <laughs> Uh, this question is actually on behalf of my sister over there, who's way Where is she? Nervous. Right over there. Where is this cowardly sister yeah. of yours? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we both have loved you for many years. Um, my question is, you played the principal on Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yes. And uh, my question is, uh, what was that like working with like Charlie Day and like Rob McElhenney? They're very serious people. <laughs> uh, I, I really was surprised at just how somber they were. Uh, no, they were. Uh, it was great. It's, I, I love that those 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 people like they they created this show. Uh, they made it exactly the way they wanted to make it, and they never listened to anybody. Uh, and and they just did. And somehow they they succeeded, and they were able to keep going. And I guess they Fox got behind what they were doing, or Fox just didn't care. Uh, but. Uh, but they were uh, they were fun. They reminded me. They kind of reminded me of working with the kids in the hall, in that it was just a group of like-minded people, and they did whatever they thought was funny. And if they came up with an idea on the on the set as they were going that they wanted to try, they just tried it. They just did whatever they they just did whatever they wanted, and fully followed whatever creative instincts uh, gripped them that day. Clearly, it works, right? It does work, and they're yeah, and they they've managed to run forever with a a show about some of the most horrible human beings that have ever lived. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. Now, on news radio. I heard of it, yeah. You, you've heard of it. Yeah. Your character, like apparently you in real life, had a coffee addiction and a love of Green Acres. Uh, those are both true statements, yes. Uh, are there other characters that you kind of let yourself shine through a little bit? Well, you probably know? all of them, because I'm a terrible actor. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, but uh, but definitely in, in in news radio, it was uh, basically my character was an, a, an amalgam of of my character flaws and Paul Sims, the creator of the shows, his character flaws. So each week it would be just depending on which one of us they wanted to make fun of more, and so they would highlight those aspects of our personalities. But definitely the coffee. Uh, when I was making news radio, I was our uh, props people clocked me at drinking 50 cups a day during a work day. Yeah, no, that's a lot of coffee. And you're yeah. alive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. And I had once told the doctor about it and uh, said 50 cups. Normally, I'd say cut down, but your blood pressure and everything is perfect. So carry on, good sir. <laughs> Good way to do it. Why Green Acres? What is it about Green Acres? Green Acres is one of the best written shows ever put on television. Uh, there, yes. <laughs> And it's, and it's mostly two, two gentlemen, Jay Summers and Dick Chevalat, wrote pretty much every episode of the show. And to me, it was always, it was a half hour of surrealistic comedy every week. It was like watching a UNESCO play. Uh, that they just had these bizarre, and it would break the fourth wall. It would, they would have things, an episode would start with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Ava Gabor and, and Eddie Albert lying in bed as the credits were still rolling and she would read the credits as they were coming up you know and going Oliver what's a best boy <laughs> you know <laughs> and they would break the fourth wall that way and they would have these insane running gags that would go through episodes and and the other thing that I don't think people appreciate is that every single character in that show played it deadpan except for except for uh, Eddie Albert Eddie Albert was the only one uh, playing over the top everyone else you know including Mr. Ziffel Everyone else is playing it really close to the bone, and no, no, like no over-the-top attempts at comedy. It was just all played really deadpan, and and you just had Eddie Albert on top of that going all the time. So if you haven't watched Green Acres since you were a kid, you should watch it again because it's a much smarter show than than people think it is. Absolutely. Now, go to the, go find the streaming service that has it. Poker. Poker. You were the host of uh, Celebrity Poker. How did yes. you get that gig? Um, uh, I, well, because the original host quit. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, if he was still there, it would have been awkward. Yes. Especially and, if you had to fire him. Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then they, uh, 
they called me up and I'd never played uh, or even heard of Texas Hold'em uh, when they first called me up. But I, but I said, well, all right, coincidentally, I said, I've just been invited to play in a Texas Hold'em tournament in commerce and uh, I've never played, but I'm gonna try to learn how to play and I'll go and if I have a good time, I'll, I'll host the show as long as you as long as you accept these these two uh, contingencies. One, I, I I know nothing about poker and I have no interest in learning. <laughs> so so I said, I, but I will happily be I will happily represent every idiot watching the show who doesn't know anything about poker, and I'll let Phil Gordon be the expert and ha let him try to teach me things. But uh, and that was kind of the chemistry of it was that I would I would just. Uh, I would know nothing, and I would make stupid jokes about poker, and Phil would uh, actually t carry the weight of, uh, of uh, like, telling well, what's actually, going on. Actually, you know, there, <laughs> yeah. that's actually a, it's got a good chance of getting a flush there, and you're yeah. like, yeah, I feel flushed. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions, please? Yes. Hey, uh, you you came at like like that, like you were going to sing a song. <laughs> Maybe I so would. please you do. Like, you look, uh, you're about to like launch into it. Yeah, the James Brown number. I might. Yeah. Um, is there any word on another season of Kids in the Hall? As of as of this moment, no. As of this moment, we're still uh, uh, we're still waiting for uh, uh, Amazon. I believe are uh, in consultations with their uh, with their algorithm, and uh, so we're waiting for the, We're waiting for the algorithm to uh, to render its decision. So, and I'm not sure how it does that. Okay, I yeah. hope you, I hope you guys get another one because the the new season was awesome and. Um, was the uh, the hole that you guys filmed at the beginning of the new season the same hole or in the same place as the hole from the end of the? No, you know? it wasn't. wasn't the exact. It wasn't the same location. I can't remember where the original location was. It was just. Uh, it was the nearest field to the studio we were shooting at. Yeah. Okay. So, but and but is it roughly the same dimensions? Yeah, it looked yeah. like it could have been the same. And we were roughly the same dimensions. I think probably we'd accumulated it somewhere in the area of about six hundred pounds of human body since then. <laughs> But, uh, but roughly the same size. And um, do you consider the new season, season six of Kids in the Hall, or season one of a new series? Uh, well, within the troupe, we, uh, we call it season six. For us, it was, we, we approached it as we were just gonna pick up as though, as though no time had passed. We were just gonna do it the way we used to do it, and, you know, and for, for better or for worse, that's what we did. We kind of just, the same thing, just being stubborn idiots and doing what we wanted. I like it that way. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Hi. I'm a huge fan. Brought my girl drink drunk shirt. Oh, cool. It was choking me though, so I changed. <laughs> a little there, closer to the mic, please. Oh. <laughs> are there any plans uh, for another Kids in the Hall tour? Uh, the, the, well, I think so. Uh, it's in early stages, but we actually. Uh, uh, yesterday, I, I, while I was here, I had a Zoom meeting with the, all the kids in the hall and uh, and uh, some agents about booking a tour. So we're, we're uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, looking at the logistics and uh, and looking at bookings right now. So maybe maybe early 2023. I think we might be out on the road for a bit. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can get a shirt that fits you better, I guess. <laughs> that doesn't choke you. And tell Kevin I love him. Nope, nope, Kevin doesn't need your love. <laughs> did, you do the, uh, did you do the Zoom meeting here at the con and your friend were like, is that Superman behind you? <laughs> yeah, well, I was in, I was in the, the roped off area behind the curtains. Uh, so there was mostly just uh, uh, friends of mine coming over to talk to me going, I can't get that. And I'm, I'm on a Zoom. Yeah. Please. Hello. Hello. Well, this question is a little more stupid than the rest of them, but you said you like reading. Do you have a book that you read, like, every time you read it, you get more into it? A book, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, I think probably, you know what, probably C Candide by Voltaire. That's, I think, is probably, I, I think might be the, uh, the greatest sort of, uh, sort of epic comedy ever written and a great template for anyone who wants to do like a, a story of uh, somebody carried away by circumstances. But I think that's probably, probably one of my, my favorite books to reread. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Came, came down from Boston, just got off a Grateful Dead tour. 
I was torn oh, for really? a month. Yeah. You didn't have um, to put on that fake Boston accent for us, though. I, right, right. Okay, so like this is a three-parter. All right. Uh, so being a kid in the 70s in Canada, what did you listen to? Uh, tell me a little bit about Nether Beast Incorporated. I saw it the other day. It was awesome. Oh, really? Awesome. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, well, in Canada, uh, in the 70s, well, one of my... Uh, God, what was I listening to in the 70s? Well, a lot of American music, yeah. but, I'll, but I'll go into some of the Canadian... I used to listen to a band called Max Webster all oh, the time. That, oh, wow, Max Webster fans, yeah. Kim Mitchell and Max Webster, who were uh, very closely associated with Rush in oh, those no days. Way. They used to open for Rush all the time. Wow. And, um, and other bands from that time, oh, my God... Uh, Oh, God. Uh, I'm trying to think of specifically That's Canadian okay. ones. Gordon Lightfoot. Uh, oh, I love who? Gordon Lightfoot, yeah. Neil Young. Uh, yeah, what was there? there was bands like what? Foot in Cold Water, Crowbar. Uh, oh, um, wow. But also, uh, in the 70s, as the 70s went along, I was really into you know Elvis Costello and XTC oh, nice. and the Sex Pistols. And nice, yeah, because the, I, there was a big psychedelic movement in Canada as well as here. So there's a lot of weird names and, and weird bands and stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so how about... Um, so Nether Beast Incorporated, real quick, any memories or any fondness, or how did you come about that? Or uh, Again, it was one of the things where just, uh, the, the script was sent to me, and I thought it was a pretty fun premise. Yeah, it was and uh, And it was that Daryl Hammond was in that, which yeah. was fun. And uh, who else? Robert Wagner yeah. came yeah. in and played, was that in was it for sick. a bit. And uh, it was just, yeah, these two, two uh, these weird brothers wrote the script and were directing it. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and it was just a fun sort of silly... Uh, you know, uh, cannibal vampire movie. Nice. And okay, and one more, and I'm out of here. Um, uh, any memories of SCTV, or did you work with any of those people in your early days coming up? Was there like a comedy troupe that you started, and then you were well, kids I tell in the you, hall? When the kids in the hall started to uh, catch on in Toronto, we got we started our club show started to be sold out all the time. Uh, one of the most exciting things for us was the cast of SCTV started showing up at our shows in this little punk rock bar on Queen Street in Toronto. So we had like Dave, Dave Thomas started coming down, Marty Short, and, and uh, Joe Flaherty came down, and, and uh, Catherine O'Hara and her sister Mary Margaret used to come every week. Uh, and so they came all the time, and I wound up hanging out with Kath, Catherine and Mary quite a bit back in those days. So that was like, so for us, that was, I mean, I remember being a kid doing Second City workshops and occasionally hearing that one of the SCTV cast was in the building and you'd try to walk past the doorway to, to catch a glimpse of them because they were like, you know, they were like, they were the, they were the gods of Olympus to us. Yeah. They're great for SCTV. <laughs> we, we have time for one more question. So this is the last one, no pressure. Just make it a really good one. Okay. And who are you? Where are you from? <laughs> so my name is Teresa. We don't have time for your preamble. <laughs> <laughs> Look here, Dave. So I talked to you earlier, and I told you that one of my favorites that you've ever done is A Bug's Life. Yes. So my question is, is there anything different in preparing for a Pixar film in relationship to, you know, doing like The Tick or something like that? Is it a little different at all? Uh, yeah. Well, one thing that's nice is you don't have to learn your lines. Because uh, you get to read them as you're doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they'd, they'd be, yeah, they'd be showing off if you learned your lines for animation. That's <laughs> uh, true. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it was, and it's interesting. It was that was my first big animation gig. I'd done a couple of I like know. small things in yeah. the past, but um, uh, it was getting used to that idea that you're that you're basically standing in a room and you just have to Im you have to imagine all your surroundings. Yep. You have to imagine all the other characters. You have to figure out where you are in the storyline, oh, and um, and you 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 are more. I think you're more dependent on a director in animation than I think any other form of acting because because wow. they're the ones that have all of that information in their heads if they're a good director. Yeah. And you know, uh, John Lasseter and Andrew Stanton are about as good as it gets. And uh, those guys acted out all the other characters in the room with me. And, and before each session, they would go through, they, had, they would have storyboards set up and they would describe everything. And John Lasseter would get up and describe all the action. He'd be like running around the room, acting out all the characters. And he gave you such a vivid sense of, of what you were doing. And he had such, you know, he brought so much uh, like emp empathy and, 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 and feeling to all of these the characters that are in the movie and discussing who they all were. So he created such a real environment that it made it a lot easier. That's Stop coughing! 
I only said that because you were trying so hard to keep it quiet. <laughs> You're being so polite with your cough. I'm so <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you oh, for spending the time with us. Thank you all. You guys are all lovely. Definitely visit him at his table. I'm sure he's got more stories that you know he can tell you. Yeah, you, you do have more, right? Uh, no, that yeah. was all of it. Uh, okay, well, never mind. Oh yeah, yeah. There's tons <laughs> stories. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming out. Hi, this is Maisie Richardson Sellers, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight. Be a legend and hit that like button, and most importantly, have fun and follow your fandom.